Hello and welcome. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Client Relations at CIM. On behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, we thank you for attending. Before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am in the city of Vancouver that is situated on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. The topic today will focus on newcomer integration into the mining sector. We have representatives from the mining industry, Human Resources Council. We have Leslie Wolcott, Director of Inclusion and Career Development, Will Mayer, Director of Marketing and Communications, and Victoria Burney, Manager, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. In addition, we have Patrick McKenzie, CEO of Immigrant Employment Council of BC. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Lou. Um, we're excited to share some of our current work. Uh, oh. We're excited to share some of our current work focused on the integration of immigrants, particularly newcomers, into Canada's mining sector with you today. We're also grateful to have Patrick McKenzie join us, and he'll speak, uh, share some information about immigrant employment councils with us. Our key starting place for today is that newcomers to Canada are an increasingly important talent pool for the Canadian mining sector. A quick note that we'll move through different terms and definitions today and we'll clarify those as they relate to the different activities and work that we've undertaken. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to kick off the presentation by looking at some labor market research related to immigrants in mining as well as uh, some research we've undertaken uh, related to uh, career challenges faced by newcomers as they uh, move into the mining sector. And I'll turn that over to Victoria to, to share that, to run us through that information. Perfect, thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, so we'll just move to the next slide. Uh, so we'll start off with our labor market research pertaining to immigrants in mining. Uh, so for this data, the immigrant labor force encompasses individuals who have obtained permanent residency and or have become naturalized citizens within Canada. So it, it excludes non-permanent residents from analysis. Uh, so non-permanent residents, meaning individuals with work or study permits who have claimed refugee status. So just to reiterate, uh, the data only includes newcomers as well as recent and established immigrants. So immigrants and mining, this has become an increasingly important topic in the recent year as immigrant population is growing at a faster rate compared to the rest of the population in Canada. So if you look at the graph here on the screen, the 13%, so that yellow line is the representation of immigrants in mining versus 32%, so that purple area, which is the representation of immigrants in all industries. So while the graph shows that there is a positive trend in mining, uh, it's still relatively flat compared to all industries. Next slide, please. So next, uh, we'll look at immigrant representation from the occupational lens. Uh, so unlike women in mining, uh, where we see some pockets of promise, uh, such as in HR and finance, immigrants are underrepresented across the board when we look at specific occupations. So looking at the graph, almost all of the bubbles representing occupations are below that 45 degree line. Uh, so that means all of them are underperforming when benchmarked against all other industry. And if we just turn our attention to the right hand side, the bar graph, you can see that all of the seven categories uh, for mining are below the benchmark compared to other industry as well. So this means for immigrants that it is a mining industry problem. Uh, so immigrants are just not choosing mining and or mining isn't choosing immigrants in the job market competition stage. So we can conclude here uh, that there are barriers here that are specific to the mining industry. Next slide, please. So in terms of mining share of the immigrant labor market, if we look at the graph, uh, you can see that there are a lot more jobs that are hugging the mid horizontal axis here. Um, we've pointed out welders as an example on the X axis, 20% compared to our Y axis here at 3%. So again, uh, there is the, a fair representation of immigrants in all industries, uh, but just not in mining. Uh, so that means that there are opportunities within the mining industry to improve immigrant representation uh, through competition, for example. Um, and if we turn our attention to the bubbles in the light blue on the graph, 
So those are the professional and physical sciences. Uh, so while uh, they do have immigrant representation in other industries, they're currently being untapped by mining. Uh, so therefore, this demonstrates that the strategy to improve immigrant representation in mining will vary. So either by expanding the labor pool or improving representation through competitiveness. Um, so ultimately, we do need to look at each occupation in order to understand the best approach. So which strategy would prove to be the most helpful to the mining sector. And finally, we just want to point out the statistic um, here that 3% uh, of all underground miners are immigrants and mining has 74% of them. Uh, so while there's a bit more wiggle room here in this example, um, expanding the labor pool would be a more effective strategy in this case, uh, in this example. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So just pivoting a bit from our labor market research, um, I would just like to take the opportunity now to share with you some research points related to newcomer careers uh, and the various challenges and considerations that are unique to individuals who have recently moved to a new country, uh, such as here in Canada. So generally, these career challenges can be influenced by various factors, uh, you know, such as cultural differences, language barriers, and just an unfamiliarity with the local job market. Uh, so we'll just go into a little bit of a further detail here. So um, our first point here uh, regarding workplace culture. So understanding and adapting to the local workplace culture can be challenging for newcomers. Um, so for example, different countries might have distinct expectation regarding communication styles uh, and professional norms as well. That can prove challenging. Uh, networking, of course, we know the importance of networking and um, finding employment. So building professional networks uh, might be challenging due to cultural differences in networking practices and etiquette. So for example, building a professional network in a new country can be challenging due to a lack of local contacts and understanding of networking practices. Uh, credential recognition, that's always a hot topic. Uh, some newcomers may face challenges in getting their foreign credentials recognized in Canada. So this can ultimately impact career opportunities and advancement for newcomers. Uh, skill adaptation, uh, newcomers may need to adapt their skills in order to meet local job market demands. So upskilling or retraining might be necessary in order to align with the requirements um, of the new job market that newcomers are entering into. Uh, and job market understanding, so just a lack of familiarity with the local job market can make it difficult for newcomers to identify suitable career opportunities. Um, such as understanding job trends in Canada and, um, you know, just knowing where to look for job openings as well. Next slide, please. So just a new, a uh, few more research uh, points. So access to resources is another issue. So just a limited knowledge of available support services, uh, such as career counseling, mentorship programs, and job placement services. Uh, so this can make it challenging for newcomers to navigate the job market effectively. Uh, for example, I think we know the importance of career counseling and mentorship services and how they can provide valuable insights, um, you know, guidance, advice related to the local job market and how to effectively navigate it. Uh, adjustment to different hiring practices. So again, an unfamiliarity with local hiring practices, resume formats and interview techniques can pose challenges for newcomers uh, during the in, uh, application and interview processes. Uh, cultural bias. So unfortunately, some newcomers may face discrimination or bias based on race, ethnicity, cultural or linguistic differences. And this can impact newcomers' confidence and opportunities in the job market. And finally, language barriers. So a uh, limited profi proficiency in the local languages can hinder effective communication at work. Uh, so this can affect job interviews, daily interactions with colleagues, um, and just overall workplace integration for newcomers. Uh, so in sum, uh, so overcoming these challenges often requires a combination of cultural adaptation, uh, language enhancement, networking efforts, and access to support services. And of course, employers and communities can play a crucial role in facilitating the integration of newcomers uh, into the workforce by providing resources and creating inclusive environments. Okay, so that uh, concludes our section on labor market and related research. Um, I'll turn it over to Leslie Wolcott now, uh, who will be speaking to Mir's newcomer integration into mining. Thank you, Victoria. 
Um, thanks, Mary Lou, for, for advancing that slide. So our my objective uh, during this next piece is to share with you the results of our newcomer integration research entitled uh, Support for Newcomer Integration into Canada's Mining Sector and Environmental Scan. The report will be posted on MIR's uh, website imminently and we'll share the link with all the registrants uh, for our session today as a follow-up. Um, next slide, please. This uh, research uh, helps to, aims to help uh, the sector with its, its uh, work on uh, meeting its needs for uh, skilled labor and filling important roles in the industry uh, related to uh, hiring as hiring newcomers uh, becomes a critical component of solving the sector's labor shortage issues. We wanted to determine um, what resources, what program support are publicly available and relevant to the mining sector in attracting, hiring, and integrating newcomers. So we undertook this, this research, which was really an environmental online scan and literature review to find out, to identify the available programs, resources, and support available to mining organizations in terms of newcomer integration. So our assumptions in approaching this research were that programs are offered by different levels of government and that those programs are coordinated and designed with some knowledge or awareness of each other. We also assumed going into this that the policies on integration levels fluctuate as we see in the news, you know, as we've seen in the news in the last couple of years and certainly more recently with those fluctuations having implications for funding and newcomer supports. Also, we understand that the government approaches to urban rural immigrant settlement fluctuate, sometimes emphasizing more urban and metropolitan uh, settlement and sometimes emphasizing more non-metropolitan uh, settlement. And that has implications for funding and supports. And our last assumption is that there is a wide range of programs and supports available for newcomer integration with different uh, levels of scope and geographic influence, timing, focus, and longevity. I'll just as we've done so far in this, this section of the work looked at uh, immigrants more broadly. So people not born in Canada, including naturalized Canadian citizens, permanent residents, and non-permanent residents. So we include amongst the non-permanent residents are persons who have claimed refugee status and or are asylum claimants, and persons who hold a work or study permit, and their family members who are living with them, provided they have a usual place of residence in Canada. So and we, just to clarify for us, that we use newcomers to refer to people who have immigrated within the last five years in this work. Um, next slide, please. So our findings really were organized uh, around level and focusing in on the sector. So we'll discuss federal programs, regional and provincial uh, supports, some local programs, I'll skim over. Um, no, I'll speak. I'll, I'll speak. I'll skim over the research. I'll speak a little bit to education and credentialing, and then there are some elements of industry and labor support that I'll skim over. And Will will have more to say about that as we proceed. So I'm just going to catch up to this next slide that we're on in terms of federal programs and supports. So there's a lot of information, indeed, on this. Uh, to back up this slide. So bear with me as I run through this in terms of the different uh, programs available at the federal level. So the labor market impact assessment is available when hiring a newcomer who does not yet have permanent resident status in the country. And it, an employer must go through a labor market impact assessment process to demonstrate the need to seek talent outside of Canada. Uh, filling the job uh, requirements with a candidate on a work permit. 
So some exceptions to this requirement uh, include some positions relevant to mining, for example, engineering technologist. So that's something to be aware of. And then linked to this, uh, there's a stream in terms of temporary foreign worker program, many of whom may be familiar with this. This enables employers to hire foreign nationals on a short-term basis through streams for high and lower wage positions or for up to three years through the global talent stream, uh, which focuses on in-demand high-skilled positions. So this stream is very focused on uh, unique and specialized talent. Mining and other types of engineers are among the eligible in-demand highly skilled positions through the global talent stream in particular. Next, I'll speak more, uh, I'll speak to the streams available through Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada manages the bulk of these federal programs, but there are several programs that offer priority pathways to permanent residents for immigrants with skills and or Canadian work experience. So the Express Entry Immigration, immigration Program has three streams, the Canadian Experience Class, the Federal Skilled Worker Program, and the Federal Skilled Trades Program, helping to fill some of our needs, particularly with regard to other uh, trades. There's a further category-based selection uh, sub-program that prioritizes jobs that may be more relevant to the mining sector, such as uh, STEM occupations, trade occupations, and transport uh, occupations, as well as uh, some prior priority for French language proficiency. Um, you'll see on the slide that the federal government is poised to offer a new innovation stream as part of its international mobility program to address, address labor shortages focused in key tech occupations. So this will entail an exemption from the labor market uh, assessment process I mentioned earlier, um, and may have employer specific work permits or open work permits for up to five years for qualified individuals. Um, this may help uh, folks in the mining sectors to streamline the immigration process for skilled international tech labor. Other federal programs support regional and other targeted efforts to meet labor needs. There's the Atlantic Immigration Program and the Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot Program. Both were launched in 2022 following a pilot program, so they're moving into more uh, more steady state. Um, the, Atl the Atlantic program, it obviously addresses labor gaps in Atlantic Canada and the RNIP or Rural and Northern Immigration uh, program uh, supports identified Northern and remote communities. We're, we're particularly interested in this stream because I think of the 11 or so communities identified, some six or so are in mining proximal areas. So if anyone is involved, is participating today and is involved in these, we'd love to have some conversation with you about this. Um, last, the Economic Mobilities, Mobility Pathways Pilot supports skilled refugees who meet uh, work experience, education and language requirements. Um, and this helps accelerate the move into permanent residence uh, applications and and also supports access to a new pool of international talent um, through the refugee stream, which is a fairly uh, significant change, I think, in Canada's uh, immigration policy and program supports. And with that, I'll move to, I'll ask to move to the next slide. So we're gonna move on to the regional and provincial programs and provincial and territorial programs and supports. Many of you may be aware already of some of the regional programs I mentioned. The, uh, these are funded through Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. And examples of these include the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, 
CANNOR, the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency, which is more focused in the territories, and for example, FEDNOR, the Federal Economic Development Agency for Northern Ontario, um, as examples. There are provincial, uh, other provincial and territorial program supports. Uh, the provincial nominee program is supported in all provinces and territories except Quebec and Nunavut, which facilitates uh, skilled international workers coming into Canada to fill in-demand uh, labour needs. Um, it's funded federally, but managed by the provinces and territories, and it enables someone to have a valid work permit and an offer of employment after, provides for a valid work per permit, pardon me, and an offer of employment after completing six months uh, continuous full time with the with the company as a temporary foreign worker or international student or working graduate. So you can see how some of these different streams are are moving into more uh, permanent uh, residency and more permanent um, uh, employment opportunity for people. There are also province-wide councils, societies, and associations supporting uh, of immigrant service, immigration service organizations. Um, and they're all listed and identified in the report that will be um, shared, that, that will be published. And these groups champion supports for immigrants and refugees through advocacy, research, knowledge sharing, and, uh, and social service supports. Lastly, uh, many of you may be familiar with regional labor market boards, which uh, in addition to providing labor market information and analysis, can facilitate networking and best practices amongst employers, community partners, and job seekers. So that's an interesting opportunity to tap into at a fairly uh, regional or localized level. We'll move to the next slide. Moving into more uh, local programs. A number of municipalities uh, provide welcome and integration services, um, as well as immigrant uh, employment councils, which Patrick and I are going to speak to uh, shortly, so I won't go too much into that. There are also local uh, immigration partnerships. I've had the opportunity to sit in on those where I am here locally in, uh, in Peterborough, Ontario. Um, these local immigration partnerships involve uh, stakeholders coming from across different sectors, such as education, healthcare, immigrant service, organizations, social services, housing, and so on, to coordinate around uh, the needs of newcomers as they integrate into a community and access uh, different needs. So that's a nice inter intersectoral approach to supporting newcomer integration. And then immigrant service agencies provide more direct support to newcomers with uh, helping them to, to meet their settlement uh, needs across the life trajectory, not solely uh, within those first five years. And then there are a host of other refugee integration and employment services that offer counseling information, candidate matching and other employment services for uh, refugees in particular. And that that sometimes maybe Patrick may this may come up in the Q and A, but that's sometimes also a bit of a an issue is how to support refugees who are here in country with the the needs that they have, where there are some constraints on the services that can be provided to refugees through some of these uh, federal programs, such as the immigrant service agencies. Mm -hmm. um, but more on that, I think later. I'll just we'll just go on to the next. That's a whole other. That's a big piece. That's a whole other discussion. Um, that may be a whole other webinar. Um, moving on to the next slide. I just wanted to highlight that there are universities making a significant contribution through their research. Uh, into understanding the challenges uh, the, that we're facing uh, nationally and regionally in Canada with regard to newcomer integration, newcomer immigrant policy, uh, 
the economics of immigration and so on. And so there's some important work being done uh, to, to support that. There's some that's focused on the West, some that's focused um, uh, maybe provincially, some that's focused nationally, but it is important work and it continues to inform Canadian policy and approaches to this. And, and I think, of, you know, the employment integration. Significantly also, post-secondary educations are uh, understanding the, the possibility and are benefiting from and working to support international students uh, with access to education. Uh, this is also creating uh, some challenges in terms of integration into uh, communities, but it has a great opportunity in terms of flow into the into the employment uh, market um, as as international students graduate and and receive credentials in country and quite frankly create families and households and have community dynamic and networks coming out of school that help them with the with access to to employment I'll speak a little bit to credentialing also. The federal government has a foreign credential recognition program that supports the labor market integration of, of newcomers uh, by analyzing the transferability of credentials uh, received maybe in the home country and then how that translates uh, to work in terms of accessing further education and or accessing uh, employment uh, opportunities. So there are six uh, six members within this program providing academic assessment services. Mir has uh, developed a little bit of a relationship with the World Education Services, um, and I think many employers may be asking potential applicants with uh, immigrating experience to have some of their credentials. Uh, verified, and this is uh, this information is something you can help people with as as necessary in the employment stream. On to the next slide. This is the piece that I'll just glaze over a little bit because Will, I think, will speak more specifically to this. Um, there are some other supports that we can offer uh, in terms of supporting uh, newcomer integration and immigrant integration. Certainly. Mining specific job boards. Uh, Mir has hosted a number of student work placements. There's a little bit of a move. I think there's some discussion maybe in terms of how to support uh, students with experience out of country to uh, benefit from different work experience opportunities. There are training and development programs available across a number of organizations. Um, so I'll leave that. I'll leave well to the, provide more depth and context there. And then moving on to the key takeaways. The key takeaways are a little bit uh, rooted in our assumptions. And I think that, that it's, it's important to acknowledge that there are a variety of supports and programs across a variety of levels of federal, provincial, territorial, regional, and local levels to help support the integration of newcomers, both sides by supporting newcomers, as well as by supporting employers. Uh, part of the problem or challenge relates to uh, understanding this complex of programs and navigating through the different uh, eligibility criteria uh, for both employers and newcomers. Um, while a limited number of programs specifically target mining, most are available to the, to the sector and have relevance for the sector. Um, importantly, integration services available at the local level offer career preparation, training, recruitment services, and so on um, to individuals. Um, and we're going to turn shortly to the, the supports available to employers. Um, I think it's also important maybe to leverage the regional immigrant serving organizations to share our mining career resources and develop some, some shared or collaborative approaches to training. With that, I'll turn to the next slide. 
and um, welcome Patrick McKenzie, who works with the Immigrant Employment Council of BC. Patrick, you we've got a slide here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to walk us through this following slide a little bit by way of telling us uh, about employment immigrant councils? Yeah, immigrant absolutely. Council, pardon me. <laughs> We'll just go to the next slide, Mary. No, no, no. So, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. It's, and uh, thank you for, for inviting me to be a part of the panel. Um, we know the resource industries, extractive industries are really important uh, to the Canadian economy. And, uh, and it's an area where I think more newcomers need to be made aware uh, of the opportunity that, that, that's there. Um, and just to give you a, a bit of background on so the Immigrant Employment Councils, so, you know, I'm the CEO of the Immigrant Employment Council of British Columbia. But there are 12 sort of like-minded organizations across the country, uh, and we all try to work together to share uh, our resources, our experiences, uh, to strengthen employers' ability to recognize immigrant talent uh, that's already here in Canada, in our communities, uh, just recognize the fact that they're there and, and give uh, employers the tools to hire, you know, recruit, hire, and, and retain uh, that immigrant talent into jobs that make best use of their skills. Uh, so that's great for the for the newcomer, and it's great for the employer too. Uh, how we really came about uh, is that uh, there was, you know, how the Immigrant Employment Council of British Columbia came about uh, back in 2008. Uh, it was that community leaders were having uh, some conversations around uh, labor market integration of immigrants and saying that there are lots of organizations doing great work to get immigrants ready for the labor market, but who was getting the labor market ready for the immigrants? So to actually understand, again, you know, going back to what I said earlier, understand this, uh, this really, uh, really deep and, and rich uh, pool of, uh, of resources that are there. Uh, and that truly has only grown deeper and richer over the last number of years, given the uh, significant increase in numbers that we've brought into the country, both as temporary residents and permanent residents. Uh, so the idea, you know, sort of the, the driving ethos behind the Immigrant Employment Council of British Columbia is how do we make it easier for you as an employer uh, to address uh, your labor market challenges? This is not corporate social responsibility. This is bottom line stuff for you. You need talent. Talent's here. How do we make sure that you can recognize it? Um, and, you know, Leslie and, and, and Victoria, uh, you guys both did a great job just in sort of outlining um what the challenges have been uh, to connect immigrants into meaningful employment, like the, those jobs that make best use of their skills. And we hear lots of stories. And we're all very familiar with the story of, of you know, the doctors driving cabs. Uh, and that tends to, to be the narrative that, that we often hear. It's one that bothers me a little bit uh, because it's, we aren't all meeting cardiologists in our taxis and Ubers. Like the numbers actually are, and the data shows that the numbers aren't really there. But it does speak to this broader issue of, of unemployment and underemployment that uh, that newcomers face, and especially when you know that we are selecting newcomers based on a human capital model, generally, uh, like the on the economic side and, and certainly the federal skilled workers side. Um, now, we call it a human capital model. It's the point system. Uh, but what's interesting is we don't assess human capital. Uh, we actually assess proxies for human capital uh, when, we, when we do that. And so... Um, what we're trying to do is create systems change here for uh, for employers. So the credential recognition conversation is an interesting one, because absolutely there are jobs out there that uh, that require a credential, they require a very specific credential. Uh, but for eighty percent of the labor market, you don't. It's uh, it's simply it's a skills question, and so we want to work with employers to help them sort of reframe what they're looking for. And it's it's one thing to use credentials as a shorthand to get to ability when we're all familiar with the credentials that are being used. But once you introduce credentials from abroad, that familiarity evaporates. And, and what we've seen is that it uh, that the the value of the credential in particular, but experience as well, gets discounted down to roughly zero. Uh, and so we lose out and use them as employers, you lose out on, on potentially a very rich uh, source of talent who could help to grow your businesses. Um, I'm going to just pop something in the chat, uh, and it's uh, it, it's from the um, uh, from uh, it's a it's a hub or a, a uh, it's an online hub that we have as part of our collective here as the uh, Immigrant Employment Councils of Canada, uh, where we pool our tools and resources for uh, for employers. 
to help you sort of some some tangible assets to to work through the process. Um, you know, Leslie, you talked about refugees and sort of challenges in, in terms of, of hiring refugees into the workplace, and and um, absolutely there can be challenges there, and depending on depending on the refugee circumstances, but you know the there is a again there there is a lot of talent that's coming to Canada through the refugee stream. We saw that with the Syrian movement uh, in particular, um, but we uh, we're also seeing that with the Ukrainian movement, even though they're not technically you know, refugees. And so part of the tools that we've created uh, are, uh, are these toolkits for employers that are very specifically geared towards Ukrainians or towards Afghans or Syrians uh, to help an employer recognize some of the unique needs of, of that group. Um, one thing I like to rem uh, remind folks of is that hiring an immigrant versus hiring a Canadian it's not like you're going from zero to a hundred in terms of need to integrate somebody into the workforce. Everyone has to be on board. You know? And so what we want to do is help you recognize the nuances of onboarding somebody who's not born, educated, trained within Canada. Um, so, you know. so Patrick, it sounds a bit like you, that IECs can assist with things like what I would call kind of skill translation and skill kind of recognizing and understanding how, you know, skills may translate to suit particular uh, positions and needs. And, and, and then we, also, and then yes, also helping with also helping with, um, you know, workplace culture and integration into workplace culture. Are there other pieces that you, you can point to? And then I'm going to ask you specifically to, to turn that to the mining sector and what does that mean in terms of mining employers? Oh, sure thing. Uh, we we do uh, like we do focus on that that skills translation. We have a, a you know the IECBC has an online program that we've actually recently partnered with New Brunswick Community College and the Collège Communitaire de Nouveau Brunswick uh, to to build that into the post secondary system there uh, to identify the skills that folks are bringing to the table today. And help connect them to jobs uh, that you need those skills right now. And so, you know, for example, in the trades, you know, we can assess someone against what's needed to be known to be or what you need to know to be a carpenter in Canada. And in the end, what we, you know, we may tell you you're not a carpenter, but you do know these things. These are certain things that you can go do. You know how to lay a floor. You know how to do roofs, uh, uh, do roofing. You know how to do concrete. You can do these jobs now. And here's your pathway uh, to becoming a, a full blown carpenter if that's what you'd like to be. Um, and in the meantime, here are the employers who are looking for folks like you uh, with, with your skills. So we we definitely uh, we definitely put an emphasis there. And at the same time, certainly the the cultural piece, uh, we have a program called Ascend, uh, and that was actually built through conversations uh, with mentors and employers who had been working with newcomers uh, who had gone through labor market training that the settlement sector had been providing. But but these mentors in particular were saying. The folks they were seeing weren't actually job ready, despite having done this training. And so we asked them, so what, what are your deal breakers? What makes you say no to a candidate? And they told us, and, and by and large, it was really around communication. It was around an individual's ability to sell themselves uh, to, to an employer. And so we built this online program. It's seven, uh, seven modules, eight workshops. Uh, and we now have roughly 50 uh, partner organizations across Canada who deliver this, these programs to newcomers uh, to help get them ready for the labor market. Um, so, you know, it, oftentimes employers will say, but they don't have Canadian experience. And, and so that's the, and it's a kind of a catch-all uh, for a number of different things. And it, and it could be simply, I just want to know that this person understands how to work in a Canadian workplace, or it could be some of that more nefarious stuff that was pointed out sort of in, in Victoria's uh, presentation around the challenges. Uh, and discrimination. Um, and so for us, what we're trying to do is help someone understand, help the employer understand that this person now gets, or at least has a, a sense of what's expected of them in the workplace and to better prepare the individual. You know, it's, it's better for everybody to walk in with eyes wide open. That's great. So there's more, much more for us to learn about the Immigrant Employment Councils. I really thank you for this and thank you for uh, putting that website into the that link into the chat. I think there may be more opportunities in the Q and A to uh, 
to dig a little bit deeper on on some of your offerings and certainly for people to learn more about about uh, how they can turn to IECs for support uh, in integrating newcomers into their workplace. I'm going to turn over to Will now, who's going to speak uh, about some of the career pieces. So thank you very much, Patrick. Back oh, to you, you probably in some of the Q&A. That's great. And uh, over to you, Will, now in terms of the careers pieces. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be providing some information on some career search resources that NIR has available to help newcomers integrate into Canada's mining industry as well as some of our career awareness and career planning tools that help people see if there's a fit for them in mining. And so while MIR is not an employment agency, we do provide search tips for newcomers to Canada. So uh, next slide, please. So working in mining obviously requires many different skills, which is obtained through a combination of education, training, and work experience. Some mining jobs provide on-the-job training, while many others require qualifications, certification, university courses, um, and such in a discipline related to mining. Uh, many people come to Canada with international education, training, and work experience, as has been discussed already today, and that can make it difficult for employers to determine where they fit in Canada's mining industry. So MIR provides tips on how to make the most of your international education and experience. Uh, education can also be evaluated by a, a evaluation agencies such as the World Education Services. You know, it's important that it, uh, newcomers understand how their education compares to an a Canadian one, and it allows them to better communicate their knowledge, skills, and experience with Canadian employers to obtain certification if they require it, licensing or registration in a regulated career, uh, or become accepted into an educational institution or program or help identify any other education that they would need for their careers so they can pursue more education. And once that's done, they need to communicate their, their knowledge, skills, and experience with Canadian employers through their resume. And we provide information uh, such as uh, free immigrant services uh, through the Government of Canada's website that can help with resume and cover letter writing. Uh, as well as also provide help with language assessment and classes, helping find a job and information about services like mentoring. So next slide, please. Mir's website, mihr.ca, also includes tips on how to make connections to open up more job search opportunities, including talking to people who are already in the industry, consulting with educational institutions and other career seekers about career interests and goals, and attending some of the major industry events that take place every year. MIHR.ca, MIR.ca also includes information on growing professional networks through volunteering. Many employers in mining are also active in their local communities, often sponsor events or fundraisers for charities where there might be volunteer opportunities. And our site also includes information on leveraging one's online presence to connect to professionals to share one's education, skills, and experience such as leveraging LinkedIn as a tool for, for networking. Next slide, please. Mir.ca also includes some other helpful resources to assist newcomers with their mining job search. Canadian mining associations like the Mining Association of Canada, PDAC, CIM, uh, et cetera, they include links to their member companies. And Mir's miningneedsu.ca website that I'm gonna be talking about in a minute it also has a list of all mining companies in Canada in one place that leads to each company's career webpage for when you're doing specific career searching. We also provide links to helpful resume and cover letter writing guides as mentioned, a job posting websites and some job recruitment agencies like CJ Stafford and Associates, which specializes in connecting executives, engineers, scientists, and managers in the mining, engineering, and construction industries. Next slide, please. So here at Mir, one of the things we've created is the We Need Mining, Mining Needs You Career Awareness Campaign. It can also help newcomers learn about Canadian mining, the many different types of careers available in mining and where their skills might be a good fit for the industry. Our awareness campaign showcases modern mining with the goals of raising awareness of mining and its profile, supporting industry HR efforts and making mining a career choice, a career of choice. To do this, our campaign focuses on modern mining, uh, also on uh, the necessity of mining, showcasing technology and environmental commitments, and by having multiple initiatives and programs 
exist within the campaign's brand. It's anchored by the moneyneedsyou.ca website where you can discover what modern money looks like, how minerals and metals are used in everyday life, mining's necessity to a low carbon economy, and how you can help Canada be a world leader in safe, sustainable mining. Next slide, please. Moneyneedsyou.ca also includes many, uh, it's about 60 or a little over 60 uh, different career profiles of careers in mining. They show that mining jobs aren't just limited to field or underground work, and they link to a couple of interactive features on our website. The interactive world of mining careers allows the user to visually explore a representation of six different mine work environments and the jobs in each area. Work areas include above ground and underground mines, workshops and processing plants, laboratories, offices and field work. And the career profiles themselves include educational requirements, uh, salary ranges, uh, and what you can expect and, and how you can succeed in any given career. Next slide, please. If you want to dig a bit, a bit deeper, there's also the interactive career quiz. It lets you see where you might fit in the industry by building a profile and answering questions around interests, environments you like to work in, tools you'd like to use, natural aptitudes, and if you like working alone or in large teams. Next slide, please. And then as mentioned, working in the mine in mining can require many different skills acquired through a combination of education, training, and work experience. And with the interactive career quiz, you get a matching career, you get matching careers that you can sort by fields like level of education, physical demand, and experience. Career options automatically update as career interests and skills are added or removed from a profile. And a career pathway then presents how an individual can advance within any given career. So I urge you to feel free to visit moneyneedsyou.ca to learn more. And with that, I'll be passing it back to Mary Lou for the Q&A portion of the webinar. Great, thank you. That was very, uh, very, very good. I'm just going to go into the chats to see uh, if there's any questions and whoever's attending, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat and I will read them. It won't be long. Um, here it says, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, that was Anika that said that, put it in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, I'm eager to join the mining sector. I have uh, a BS and, uh, and an MS in geology from Nigeria. I am a PR and arrived in uh, November 2023. The only experience I have in mining is a one-year experience as a ge geologist in a quarry. Can you, um, what can I do to break into the industry? I'm staying in Saskatoon. And then, yeah, somebody answered there. Please join the CIM uh, Saskatoon branch events uh, and take a look at Mears Council's Green Job Program. That's great. Yeah, I can give a bit more information on the uh, Green Jobs Program. It's, it's Will here. Um, that one is a program for uh, youth between the ages of 15 and 30 uh, for um, them to have work placements in mining companies that relate to the environment in some way. We provide a wage subsidy to employers who hire individuals of that age range. Um, if if the individual who asked the question uh, is not within that age range, there are other um, options through the Government of Canada through potentially work placement that you can take a look at looking at Canada.ca and doing a search there. And then as I mentioned during my presentation, um, there's looking through the job profiles that we have on miningneedsyou.ca as well as like I said on the that website, there's a page that lists all mining companies in Canada, links directly to the their career pages. So if there's organizations, companies within your area, uh, in Saskatoon or elsewhere nearby, if you're willing to travel, you can take a look there and see what kind of requirements they're looking for in terms of uh, positions. Good. 
there's a question here. Approximately how long does the accreditation process take if I'm a, if I'm a mining engineer? Will, do you, do you want me to, I can jump in and say something. Patrick and Will may have some comment on this as well. I, I as I understand it, where there are professional uh, credentials that need to be evaluated, uh, some that may occur through, for example, the engineer engineering association and engineering associations, and that the length of time it takes may vary in terms of the credentials that you're putting forward also, because that's a very individualized process. Um, I do know that sometimes organizations like the World Education Services or those other credentialing organizations offer uh, some support and or do, uh, do work in collaboration with those professional associations to help facilitate that process. And then, Generally, that's all I'm able to contribute on that, but others on on the panel may have more information. Yeah, I, I guess I'd just hop in and, and sort of pick up on so the, the regulated versus unregulated bit. So if you're looking for a, an engineering job that actually needs your, your ticket, like it needs a, a PN or needs a, a specific designation, then it is that that regulator and it's, it's figuring out who that regulator is and how to contact them. And that alone can be a, a challenge, uh, especially if you're still overseas. You know, it's uh, just trying to figure out and navigate, uh, navigate the system here. Um, to me, though, a, a key step in this is in figuring out what skills you have that can translate into an unregulated job quickly. Um, so, and this isn't about devaluing so the skills that you bring to the table. It's not about looking for lesser jobs. Uh, it's about trying to make that connection. Uh, and, and again, like a really suitable and meaningful connection to say, these are the skills I have. Uh, this is how I can present them to an employer to demonstrate that I can solve their problem. Um, now that, and again, that, that works in an unregulated job. Uh, so for ones where you actually do need a, a particular designation, then it does come down to that regulator. There's been lots of work done with regulators over the last 15 or so years uh, in particular uh, to try and streamline uh, credential equivalency and credential recognition. Um, but there's lots more work that needs to be done. And, and there are, my numbers would be a little out of date on this, but I remember you know, giving a presentation years ago when I was in government and it was, uh, I think there, there was over 400 credentialing bodies in the country. Uh, and so, uh, good luck uh, navigating that uh, truthfully. <laughs> uh, so, just to, like to 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 make sense of it is is a, is a huge huge challenge. And I think provinces can do a lot more uh, to uh, to to kind of streamline the because that's where a lot of the most of the regulators are provincially uh, sort of mandated. Uh, so, there's a lot more work that can be done there. Um, there's another question here in terms of newcomers. Would that include an international student com completing their studies in Canada? Go ahead, Patrick. So, like, like for me, it, yeah, like, international students are a really important part of the immigration system right now. The numbers are huge. Anybody who's been paying attention to media knows that it's been a really contentious issue. Uh, and the government's come out with some, pretty, the federal government's come out with some pretty significant announcements in the last week uh, on this. Um, but uh, I, I think international students are a tremendous opportunity for employers. Uh, you have someone who's already begun the integration process. Uh, their language skills are up to scratch to begin with, uh, and they're getting a Canadian credential. And so for employers to start digging into the international student population early in their educational career, I think would be a very wise move. Uh, uh, for the mining industry, one of the challenges is overwhelmingly immigrants are going to urban centers, uh, certainly as permanent residents, but smaller schools attract a lot of international students. And, and that's a, you know, th that's a great place to look. Good. Another question. Um, are there any resources for women who'd like to change sectors moving from leadership roles in other public sectors into mining? What are the leadership designations uh, recognized in the mining industry? Cool. I, I can jump in. 
I just with a little bit of lived experience, having jumped from kind of leadership roles in public education into uh, MIR, uh, my my experience is that uh, the designations hold. So, for example, if you're looking, if you're working in an engineering role, then the designation holds. If you've got uh, training and background in human resources or in accounting, then those designations hold. It, again, is transferring those skills to what the relevant skill sets are, are for the sector and talking about how uh, what you've done applies to the sector and is relevant to the sector. That's that's all I can offer by way of a bit of you know individualized experience. Mm. And then there's other other support um, services that come through, say, Women in Mining Canada and other other groups that uh, focus on this issue directly. Um, another question: Where can an employer go to see if a newcomer's education applies or qualifies for the job? Are there any assessments or tools available online? Yeah, I guess I can jump in on that one too. There are. Um, uh, the education, their credentials has to be assessed by an organization or professional body that is designated um, to do so, I believe through Immigration uh, Refugee Citizenship Canada. And... Um, I, I noted one in my presentation, uh, the World Education Services, but there's also uh, International Qualifications Assessment Service. Uh, I think there's the International Credential Assessment Service um, and a few others. So to, to find that, uh, I believe they have a list of designated organizations on the Government of Canada's website. But I mean, I think the, the important distinction there, though, is that is that's an educational equivalency. It doesn't actually like it certainly wouldn't say you're a PN uh, or a lawyer or a school teacher or like anything that, that's regulated. And so that becomes the I think that's one of the biggest challenges in our selection system is that we lead people to believe that their credentials have been approved uh, and their experience has been approved because the government says we get points for it. Uh, but it only works for that particular part of the immigration process. And then once it comes to the, once it comes to actually finding a job, it's back to square one. Uh, and so, you know, what, one of the, for us at the Immigrant Employment Council of BC, we've created a, again, a skills or a competency assessment program in, in six different sectors. And mining's not one of them, but we are in the trades, uh, some trades. So, where we can look at it and say, okay, well, th these are the skills you have that you've you've been able to demonstrate. Uh, how do we, like, how do we how do we help you show that to an employer? How do we help you understand what those skills are? How to apply them in the Canadian labor market, and then give you the story to tell to an employer to make you a more attractive candidate. Well, that's good. Um, we're coming to the end of our of our session. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for everyone uh, attending and thank you to our uh, speakers uh, for this great topic. If we haven't had a chance to answer all your questions, they are in the chat and I will share them with, with uh, our, our panel um, and we will make sure that we do answer um, your questions appropriately. Thank Perfect. you so much, Mary Lou and everyone. Thank yeah, you thank so much. much. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.